If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. Neil, this is Houston. We're copying. Uh, everything is go here. We shall fight on the beaches and in the streets. We shall never surrender. I mean it just to rewrite history Cause I'm in the mood to Label us the leaders of the leaders of the new school This ain't for the radio Can't find this on YouTube This the type of killing that these critics say you used to You're a group of happy rebels You've said no to the rules of the game Or the regulations of the day You've said no to the conventional wisdom You're all originals In this day and age I got time for innovation Time to be creative Time to make the Welcome to the 90 Proof Wisdom Podcast, where we dream big and challenge the conventional wisdom. This podcast is about distilling the lessons we've learned in life, business, and turning them into tools that will help you succeed personally and professionally. We're about standing firm, running toward the battle, building communities, changing the game, and staking our claim. Hey, thank you everybody for tuning in today. I'm sitting here with John Porter. He's been a, I'd like to say lifelong friend and mentor, but it's been... Seems like. Seems like, yeah, right? I'm sorry I've done that to you. And see, I think we've known each other since about 2006, and it feels yeah. like 47 years for you. So <laughs> that's just great news, right? Anyway, we met in kind of un, abnormal circumstances, I should say. Uh, what moved to Morgan, Utah for me and uh, wasn't an active churchgoer, and uh, met the neighbor who was my bishop and invited me to go to go to church one day by a little beer proposition. <laughs> one of the great stories. One of the great stories, <laughs> of, the great stories, <laughs> stories of Morgan <laughs> County. So he says, if it takes a couple of those to sit you through sacrament, I'll bring you some over, <laughs> which, which was classic. So we ended up going there and uh, ended up going a little bit more frequently. And then we got involved in a community project that the county got really frustrated with. One of the neighbors was leaking a little bit of water on the roof and uh, went into his bed. And oh. remember that game? Dude, that was, uh, I mean, I've done humanitarian work in lots of countries around the world. I've been in Africa, Central America, South Seas, and right in our own community was one of the saddest things you ever saw. Uh, I don't know how long uh, he'd been living there, but um, he had one, the city gave him one light bulb. because he Well, he was taking the power from the neighbor. Oh, didn't that that. Yeah, oh, they didn't it was an extension cord and a hose. Oh, jeez. Right. So he had one light bulb in the house. He had a leak that was leaking on his bed. Um, middle of winter in Morgan. It was just a, it was just a bad deal. Sad, sad deal. Yep. Yeah. So we kind of made, I put this little thing together that the city said if I did it, I'd go to jail. I'm like, well, that's fine. I don't have anything better to do. Well, and, and I shouldn't use that line because I, I gathered up our troops, my friends and my neighbors that were willing to go to get in trouble with me, Brent Farley and Pinnacle yeah. Construction. Yeah. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden here comes this little gray Jetta. <laughs> Dude, right. It was a sweet. Jetta. It was a sweet Jetta. <laughs> little Roxy sticker uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, yeah, it was hot. I mean, <laughs> so here comes this and, and I'm like, hey, what's up? He's like, hey, I'm here to help. And I'm like, yeah, you probably don't want to do this today. We're supposed to be going to jail if we do this. He goes, well, I don't have anything better to do. So that was yeah. John's line. It's Saturday. We don't have anything better to do. I'm like, all right, yeah. grab some gloves. Well, we and it all turned out. orange anyway. We right, look so. good in orange. <laughs> I, well, I don't know. I, 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 I've never been in it. But I wouldn't be afraid to do it for that reason. Not for that reason. Not for no. that reason. So it ended up working out fine, and the county worked it all out great. And John stepped in and really helped, and all the neighbors. Tur- yeah. I mean, it was a wonderful it, it turned turnaround. Into a great thing. Yeah. Yep. It was. It was yeah. good. So then, at that minute, because I'm a pretty rough around the edges guy, I'm like, okay, I like him. I mean, I don't care. <laughs> fine, I'll like well, the guy. <laughs> we were. <coming. laughs> We were covered from head to toe in, in asphalt uh, and uh, dust, sh- dust and garbage. And it looked like just, and it was, it was an awesome day. It was really good. It was awesome. Yeah, so I'm like, okay, I guess on. I can get along with this dude. <laughs> I right. mean, I don't want to, but I'll do it. Well, he'll do it, but just don't tell anybody. <laughs> just don't tell anybody. <laughs> right. I've got an image to got it. Yeah, I've got to just be this hardcore guy, really. So bottom line, John, he's been there through my thickest moments. And I don't know if I have a better personal relationship with anybody on the planet. And I mean that on a thing outside of my immediate family in my own household yeah. under my own roof. And I dare say even better than my dad or my mother, there's only one person and it's been yeah. John Porter. Uh, so, I mean, honestly, it's been, he's been a mentor and not just a mentor, but he's been a life changing person in my life. He's believed in me when I didn't, he's stepped forward when I couldn't, he's carried my luggage when I couldn't. And so to me, 
the the unique ability that John Porter has had, and not just from me, but I'm from our whole neighborhood in our in our stake in our in our county of Morgan. You hear this as a common theme, and his ability to connect with people inside or outside the church is unique to John Porter, and has made it fairly easy to have the, this, these discussions. So. The other question I get a lot in Morgan is like, how can you be around John every day and not go to church every Sunday? I'm like, well, I get my church like three times a week from John. So <laughs> by the time Sunday comes around, I'm super tired. <laughs> Just <kidding. laughs> Yeah. I used to have that requirement to be my friend, but I dropped it. You dropped so, that yeah. a while back? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Like well, when thank six. goodness. <laughs> right? <laughs> when you were sick. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. No. It's, it's yeah. a funny conversation, but I, I just... There's just very few people on the planet that I consider to be so close that I would entrust anything and everything. And I, and I feel the same way. Like you've entrusted me with a lot and, uh, it's just been a wonderful deal for me for the last 15 no, years. That's, that's reciprocal. I mean, those things that we've been through, that's what builds the relationships. And, um, from the first day when you're, uh, when you recovered from head to toe, uh, I knew your heart, how uh, the things you cared about and things you valued and the people you value. And it's, uh, it's been an easy relationship, uh, but it's uh, not been an easy path right, sure. that sure. we've uh, walked along, but it's been an easy relationship for me. You know what I think makes it easy is we fight well, too. Well, look, that, that's uh, the great thing about you um, is that uh, I think, uh, I, I hope it's true of both of us, is that we are who we are, and uh, we don't put on any particular air for anybody else, and um, we're diff very different people, but we are who we are, and we but our values are really similar. We care about people. We care about making people's lives better, and, um, you know, I think those are things that have held us together over all that time. Well, I think that's 100% true because it's bigger than us. And when you have something that you value bigger than you, it's easy to keep things together. If it's just yeah. you, it's really just you deep. But if you have the world that you care about, if someone has the common goal of you bigger than you, you know, keeping something together bigger than yeah. you, it's really easy to stay in that boat. Sure. Right? Yeah. When you're self-centered, you, you can't do it. If we were focused just on uh, <coughs> uh, balance sheets and income statements, um Long ago. Yeah, we had dumped this years ago, but that's mm -hmm. not what, uh, that's not who we are, what we're trying to do. And uh, you help, uh, it's amazing how many people you help every day with this business and um, just what you do in your own community with your family. It's, uh, it's remarkable. You're, you, uh, Jeremy, I mean, he, how many guys work fire when they don't have to work fire? Uh, he works fire because he wants to help people and uh, he loves people and, and uh, whatever he can do to make their lives better, that's what he's anxious to do. And so uh, we do it different ways, but we still have those things that, um, you know, how we go about trying to help people. And, and um, it's, uh, I think, really significant. And I think it's a major part of what we do. It's, it's a major part of why you're building a business the way you're building the business. The uh, reason I built the business, uh, my own personal businesses, is because we want to help somebody. Sometimes it's just the people that we are providing a paycheck, providing a good environment to work in. But sometimes we take those resources and uh, do things um, uh, for others that they would not be able to do. And so those are the things that make uh, that make life satisfying. A hundred percent. Yeah. Isn't that funny how it's more fun for us to watch somebody go to Disneyland than us go? Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. It's weird. Well, especially in that example. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, and I don't mean that. I honestly am like, when I go to Disneyland, you'd laugh because I have my Mickey Mouse ears on and I'm running as fast as I can. I try to beat my nine-year-old to the right. Well, she's 10. Sorry, Annie. But, you know, I'm always yeah. the one racing. I, I love Disneyland. I don't like what they stand for today, oh, yeah, but I enjoy well. the heck out of uh, I enjoy the heck out of the rides. No, I love being there with my kids and grandkids. When you watch those kids come off of the uh, come off the ride, you're like, oh, yeah. man, that's awesome. That right. is worth it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I've had, you've had the opportunity <laughs> to hear, like, all my confessions in every way, and unfortunately they're unedited. But at the same time, I've never really heard your background, where you started, you know, school. I know you went to BYU, which is super sad. It makes sense <laughs> a I lot. But I overcame that. <laughs> you overcame that. <laughs> right. You got through it. <laughs> yes. So yes, I fought my way through. You fought yes. your way through, and you were yeah. able to be a success nonetheless. Right. Which exactly. is which is quite right? I mean, intriguing to me. <laughs> <laughs> but when you kind of just start, like, grew up in Morgan. I don't know. No, What's the story? No, 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 no. I was raised up in the Boise Valley, so uh, out in uh, Meridian. In so, Idaho, and you still pulled this yes, off. Yes, I'm telling you, got well, this two, is two strikes, yeah, right? Humbly. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so I was raised on a farm and a um, uh, real tight community. You know, it's time to do hay. We just all went around, and did everybody else's hay, and uh, it was that was those were it was a great place to live. Great friends, and 
involved in sports, and it was just a, it was a great it was a great life. And then uh, uh, I went on a mission and went to Scotland. Had a tremendous experience there. I came home, went to BYU. Um, that's where I found my wife. Worked for a couple of years, and that's where I learned. Uh, um, it, so that's kind of interesting because I had some really nice job offers. So one uh, one was with IBM, and the other one was uh, with Ford. And in our business school, they were kind of um, sought after jobs. And I just didn't feel good about them. I turned those down, went to work for a friend of my dad's who's a very successful entrepreneur up in Nampa for like half the price. And somehow my wife completely tolerated that. Um, but that's where I learned that I really wanted to uh, have my own business rather than uh, work in the corporate world. So I didn't know what to do, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. He was uh, just a super impressive uh, guy. Uh, so came through a tough, tough background, but just uh, really, uh, uh, really made his way. Uh, he ended up, he was on the state board of education for Idaho. There were eight PhDs and then him and he, he was a dropout at eight uh, in the eighth grade. And oh, so, yeah. right, <laughs> right. So, so it made perfect it sense, right? <clears throat> but he, I, I guarantee you, he was as educated as any of them. He was, he was super impressive. Anyway, so that's where I said I want to do that. Went back, got an MBA at Texas A&M. And then after that, I went to work for DuPont, um, one of the biggest companies in the world and looking ahead. I thought you did work corporate world. And well, I was, I was looking ahead 25 years at my boss's boss and saying, I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. Right. And so um, uh, about that time, uh, one of my old mission buddies, he had a small business down in Dallas, asked if I was interested in coming. And um, I just wanted to go learn that world. I didn't expect that to be a forever career. But um, when we went down there. um, What type of business was it? He had a call center. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's where I got acquainted with him. Got it. And um, he had one client, paid him really well, um, but they figured out, that they paid him really well. <laughs> well <laughs> right? We all figure that out yeah. at some point. Like, so, why is their checks bigger than mine? <laughs> exactly. So they, once they figured that out, they started to get more and more pressure. And we were there just for a few months and just felt like, you know, we need to, uh, we need to go do something different. So we came up here to start a business and we ended up starting a call center business. Um, my first client uh, was uh, Zions Bank, uh, which is crazy. I still can't believe they did it, but they gave me a contract to do a survey. And, um, we started off, man, me and two people, uh, Matt Porter and Randy Berger. And, uh, we started manually dialing, um, these, uh, the other people who had, uh, a credit card and weren't using them. We find, did a little survey to find out why they weren't using them. And then we uh, gave them an incentive to use them and, and moved on. And that's how we started. And, uh, just two people in a where it's actually the old RC Willie warehouse over there. So right next to where we, yeah, <clears throat> where yes. we were in our yes. first location of Murphy door. It actually was. No, that was my second site. Oh, it was. That was the second site. The first yeah. one. So if you know where RC Willie is over there, the, the warehouse right behind there. Yep. It's actually the warehouse. Oh, so you were just behind us then on the other side yes. of the liquor store. Yes. And I thought, this is the coolest place. This is going to be great. You know how you get with <laughs> Sure. <laughs> it's my own space. Uh, dude, it's like a warehouse, but it didn't look like a warehouse to me, right? So it looked like your future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so we were, I was all excited about it. So, uh, but we did eventually uh, move over to the space you're talking about. We were right there, and that's where we grew. And so now, anyway, so the call center business, we've got uh, sites around the world now, and that's uh, done you really have well. Several thousand seats at some points, right? Different parts of the flex. And yeah, yeah, depending on uh, <laughs> what's going on. In fact, right now, um, Gosh, we can't uh, we can't staff enough. But uh, you know, uh, we th- this is this is an interesting thing. We um, I was bothered that um, uh, anytime I went in the third world, it bothered me. The first time I was in the third world, I was uh, in Egypt as a nineteen year old, just before my mission. And for a kid from Meridian, there wasn't really anybody poor, and there wasn't really anybody that was like rich right we were just kind of all same place same kind of thing and whatever and people had different challenges but we didn't know about it right we, they were just, we were just kind of all the same mm-hmm. and uh man uh we dropped into cairo we we're gonna go see the pyramids i didn't see the pyramids all i saw was the little kids and uh that had man that that had a crazy impact on me super profound yeah. life-changing oh, moment i was just like how can we how can that be um 
you know, just anyway, you know, the stories, but, but it really impacted me. And I thought that can't, I got, I got to try and help that. Right. And, um, so, um, so I had some uh, relationships, uh, from Dan Lillianquist, had some relationships in the Philippines and I thought we need to, we, we need to try and help those people. Some of those people were just anybody that, uh, you know, cause if you get a call center job in one of those worlds, it's, it's, uh, in our world, it's kind of the entry level um, career step. Yeah, where over there, that's a solid middle class job. It means that your kid can have food, your kid can have medicine, your kid can go to school. They don't have to drop out at uh, seventh grade to go out and and hawk, you know, goods on the street. They can mm-hmm. they can stay in school. It makes an enormous difference to them. And so we didn't really even have a contract. I just said, we've just got to figure this out. It, hadn't, it was a, a, a spiritual impression. And so we did, and we um, found one little thing, and we sent it over there, and we peeled off another little thing, and then pretty soon it was working okay, and then um, uh, began to grow, and um, pretty soon it became profitable and uh, grew, and then we thought we need one uh, closer. So we put one down in El Salvador, did the same thing. We peeled off some of their work, put over there, began to grow. Now there's thousands of people that are employed there. Um, but it's, uh, incredibly gratifying for me to see not only the growth of those individuals and the growth of how that's come, but to know that every, every kid, every professional, a lot of these people have, most of these people have college degrees that are working for us over there. Uh, they have health care. They have a job. Most of them have some mode of transportation to buy a motorcycle or a car if they're really lucky. Um, but they, their lives are different. And um, it's really hard to grow as a person if you are just trying to grind out um, a sandwich. living. Yeah, how, how do I, what am I going to eat tonight? Mm-hmm. It's hard to grow as a person. And so these people are growing. They're learning. They're having experiences. And Man, uh, that's been that's been very satisfying to us. We've grown um, past there, but that's um, interesting. I'm just really fast on how how hard it is to grow as a person when you're worried about your day to day, just what you're eating, right? <clears throat> so people get stuck, and I think this is where, for me, there was that point when we had our little walk around focus, yeah, for a while. You, yeah, I kind of got in a headspace that it was just about how do you get tuna on the plate. Right. And then there was the opportunity that you presented of you just to reflect well, back on what your skill set. I, I mean, looks I like. think they know this, but um, uh, Jeremy. So, so what's awesome about this? I get to talk about you in the third person while you're sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking to you <laughs> yeah. about him. And it's kind of awesome. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, you know, he's got this great, great business mind. But he didn't have a lot of the classical training that uh, would normally go with that. And, um, um, twice he built a great business and, and twice, no fault to himself, he got crushed. And this was a time he'd been crushed. It wasn't his fault. Um, it was, um, uh, it was the uh, 2008 crash and, um, he had a terrific business and it crashed on him. But when that happens, I mean, it impacts, it impacts you Mm -hmm. and it impacts how you're feeling and what your confidence is. And, and you kind of pull back and man i i was like i could still see jeremy as the leader when jeremy had just got his uh, trash kicked and it was i mean it was a tough that was a tough time tough tough and i i can say i never got to an ultra depressed mode but i got into salvation mode of like okay yeah, well my kids right. aren't gonna starve i wasn't one that i didn't go home I didn't go lay down on oh, my no, bed. Oh, no, heck no. You were working like crazy. I, you just had to find something that's going to pay the bills. Yeah, and, and the good thing was, I guess what I was going at with that, when you say your headspace, you're looking at putting food on the table, and I appreciate that, by the way, but at the same time, when you go to look at it, you do forget to look forward. It's really hard to look forward, right? Because you're just like, okay, I need to eat. And then I got stuck in this mind space of... <clears throat> How do I get my kids shoes? How do I make it so they're not teased at school? So then I just kind of dived into work, but I didn't look at what tomorrow looks like. I was looking at like, what does today look like? And it took a, a conversation from you to pull you aside and say, hey, if we were to do this little deal together and I was to put some money in for you and I'd like to you to look at over here, like look over here. I'm like, 
I'm trying to look at what I'm going to do for dinner. Like, how are you telling <laughs> yeah. me to look over here? Yeah. Right. So, but just to be able to remove myself long enough to say, okay. And it took me months. If you remember, it's not like, no, no. think of this. It was a, it was a gradual yeah. stepping stone of like, okay, he's, you've programmed something in your head that you do need to still consider tomorrow and not always consider today's deal. But these individuals you speak of, they get stuck in the day-to-day -day operation, and it's hard to even consider a little bit. Yeah, see, look, tomorrow. when you get, when you, especially when you have failures, you've got to be super careful not to see yourself as a failure. What I could see in you was, even though there had been failures, you had tons of resources, right, that came from those experiences. Um, you had contacts. You had know-how. I mean, it's not like you were starting from nothing, Right. Um, but when you have just come off of one of those things, it feels like you're starting, you know, you really are sitting in a, in a bunch of ashes, but you've got to be able to see yourself as a phoenix and come out of there. I, I, uh, I remember I had a conversation with a guy and he, he was a contractor and he said, um, he said, I don't care if my team builds the building upside down. At least I have a crew and I have materials and I've got somewhere to start. And it's the truth. And you had somewhere to start, but because of where you were and trying to work your way through uh, the mess and the legalities and, and the frustration, right? Right. Because you had, you had plenty of money, but people weren't paying you. And Their receivables were ridiculous, right? It, right. It's just, I mean, it, it was completely just, you know, not, not fair to you, but we had to get your head over looking over here because you did have those resources, you did have those contacts, you did have that know-how that was scarce. Not everybody knows, very few people know how to do what you knew how to do. And so that was really what that conversation was about is that, hey, look, you you have way more than you think you have. Um, and at that point, I mean, it's hard to see that when you're Oh, I couldn't point. see it. Yeah. But I wanted to kind of reel in and say, okay, when you come back and you, you get your start, obviously focus is a a big brand and you have several brands you're involved with like like murphy door and every other brand i come around like oh johnson <laughs> yeah figured anyway <laughs> so uh, where is it the start how did you get your money how did you get your start was there an injection was there oh a, you know uh how did it work no i scrounged it up the same way you did uh we had to bootstrap uh so that's why we were manually dialing so um, we, um, uh, when I was working at, um, uh, with DuPont, uh, Conoco was a, uh, DuPont owned Conoco and I was on that side in Oklahoma. Uh, we saved, uh, we saved, so, uh, my wife and I worked really hard to save some money. Um, we, uh, we, uh, do you care disclosing how much you saved so people know what you no. can start with? Yeah, we start, we, we, uh, we had saved $15,000. Part of that was an exit from Conoco. They were downsizing and I volunteered. Okay. And so they gave that to us. So we, so we stepped out, but, uh, we never had uh, any money we had. We were trying to save to be able to start the business. And once we had the business, we put everything back into the business. And so, um, gratefully and to her credit, I had a, uh, my wife was willing to, you know, our friends lived much higher, uh, lives and, more comfortable homes and more comfortable cars. And she had the, she was locked in in the same vision, trusted me with it. And so, how did you get her locked in? So the question is like Shannon could care less about money and you know this already, mm -hmm. but we, our house is pretty normal. What 1,575 square feet on the main and then about the same in the basement. Right. And you, everybody asked, why don't you move? Why don't you, it's like, it's the least thing I care about. It's the last thing. But at the same time, Shannon, I think, and this isn't to discredit, but the vision of growing a business value versus making money off every door we sell or every ladder we sell or whatever, or off getting a rent income every month that she, sometimes it's harder for her to process the long-term investment yeah. of the company that really, so Annie asked me this question yesterday. There was a McLaren that parked at the Harmons in Farmington and she goes, dad, why don't you buy a McLaren? Can you buy a McLaren? I'm like, I can buy a McLaren if I want, I guess, but it's not what I want. Right. And she goes, why? Don't you make a lot of money on your doors? I said, yeah, but my money doesn't come from doors. My money comes from the business in the long run. Right. So we don't pay ourselves. Like I don't every door that gets sold. So I was trying to, I mean, she's, yeah, no, no, that's so good. you try to educate her. It's like, look, it's not, it doesn't matter how many doors we sell. That's not what I'm building. I'm not, I'm not building a door ladder cell count or, you know, a door counter or a cell well, income off of that. Yeah. <clears throat> so what you're establishing. So, I, I mean, 
you know, uh, no question for me, the most influential person in my life was my dad. And so he had taught me all kinds of these principles. And so there's an old Jewish um, proverb or um, adage that says, uh, I'll live for 10 years like nobody else will, and I'll live the rest of my life like no one else can. Well, 10 years is, you know, that's that's a little fuzzy, right? <laughs> Which ten years? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> mm, right. <laughs> but but uh, Connie bought into that, and um, she's uh, she's a uh, she, I, I think she's a little like Shannon. She was pretty simple and and uh, didn't have big demands. And um, uh, we uh, we worked together as a team, and she could see what was happening, and and um, it really was a mutual thing that we did together. We tried to raise our family and tried to build a business and whatever. And so she. She had enough. We always had enough. We always felt blessed that way. But um, to be clear, Shannon feels that way too. She just doesn't understand how you build brand value, not door unit count value. Oh yeah, right. right? right so right. I, I'm, I don't want her to, to, to her credit, she could care less if we lived in a car again. Mac Absolutely. No, no, I know. She could care that way. less. I know. But it's just how do I do a better job of teaching her what that is? What does the long term really look like, and how does that really well, cash? It, well, because here's <clears> the deal. Um, the, the reason that it's hard for you to be able, in my opinion, for you to be able to articulate that is because there isn't, there isn't a particular exit or outcome that you're after. You're not after the time when you're going to sell the business and have millions of dollars to be able to buy the big house and drive the McLaren. And that's not you and it isn't me. Well, and that's what she says. She goes, can't you sell it for that right now? I'm like, Shannon. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but that's not what we're doing. That's not what I'm doing. No, yeah. what we're doing <laughs> is building a better world for people. We're building a better world for employees. We're building a better uh, uh, outcome for the people who buy Their the family. product, right? Um, we're making people's lives better and that's what we're doing. And the satisfaction comes in building the business and changing lives. It isn't an outcome of income that we're after. And, um, so I think that Connie could see that and, and like you, uh, her, her life got better, you know, just like Shanna's life has gotten, mm -hmm. gotten better. Your, your home is beautiful. And, um, but, um, when they see, uh, when they see the outcome of other people's lives being better and they see if, for instance, and in, with you, what you give to the community and, um, uh, that's probably, of, I don't tell her much about that. She's like, I didn't know you did that. I'm like, well. Um, you might want to tell her to let her be a part of that. Yeah. Right? I, I tried, you know what it comes down to, I don't like you, people to know well, a lot of you're, you're, yeah, right. <clears throat> you don't, you don't brag about it. But the thing is that Shannon's a part of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, it's, it, it's your time that is there. That it's your money away. that's there. And for her, her and the kids, they probably ought to be a part of that. So, you know, why I'm careful is I don't want that awkward grocery store moment where the kids are like, oh, my dad did that for them. Yeah. Right. So I'm trying well, to protect. That's one reason why it's easier for me to be doing something in Guatemala. Because your kids are going <laughs> Right. Because they're not seeing yeah, they're, anybody in the grocery yeah, store. That's, that's the hard part. <laughs> right. Like I don't yeah. want the awkwardness and it's easy. It's easier for me to not have yeah. to worry about what my when, kids are when saying. It's, when it's close to home, I agree with that. But you do enough over on this side. Oh, sure. Yeah, right. I mean, well, you do a ton over on this side and you can let them go and be a part of that. Let them feel that. So. Uh, you know, I remember taking our kids on a humanitarian trip. That this, our first one was to Guatemala, and um, uh, we were up in it's called the Pola Cheek. It's like the most remote region. Um, they're indigenous people, and uh, it was so fascinating to watch my kids. My youngest would have been eight, and my oldest would have been what, so fourteen or something. And it didn't make any difference where they, they couldn't speak, the, they, they, those kids didn't even speak Spanish, they spoke, they, they spoke Kachi. And so there was no communication. But we took a soccer ball, and all of a sudden they were all playing and they were teaching each other songs and hand gestures and all those fun little things. And all of a sudden, all the barriers of, you know, of, of different uh, economic status, racial status, religious status, it was just all gone. They were just kids and they were just Weird. playing. Oh, right. Right. And they were just playing. And, um, uh, and it was, it was a really, really great experience for them to be a part of and for us to be a part of. And those adults that we were with, we didn't do stuff for, we don't, from a humanitarian viewpoint, we don't ever do for people what they can do for themselves, but we help them do what they can do. Right. So we mm -hmm. won't go in and build them something and leave. We go with them 
And with them, we build something that they need and help them build it, but we won't ever do something for them. Otherwise, it doesn't help them at all. And um, to be able to work side by side, we were just in Kenya last year, and I'm telling you, um, we were building a schoolhouse, and this was the project. Uh, I was with Choice Humanitarian, mm -hmm. and uh, we were building a schoolhouse, and uh, the men were out in the field. They were doing their work. So I sat there, um, uh, me and my friends, um, with about probably 30 um, Kenyan women in one of the most remote places I've ever been, one of the poorest places I've ever been, one meal a day, same meal every day, all year round. Um, some lentils, it's a lentil. Uh, they have lentils, they have a kind of a rice cake, and that's what they eat. Um, chickens, uh, they have chickens, they have cows, but they sell those. That's where they get cash, so they don't ever eat that. So it's this little, this little lentil stew and this little rice cake. And the, uh, if you ever, if they get enough rain in the rainy season, they get a like a watercress that they'll put in there. But that's it. And so I'm sitting there with me and my friends, and probably thirty women, and we have uh, they have uh, a sh uh, shovels and a and a pick. Um, and we're digging out the foundation for the schools. And I've got these little women, teeny, with their baby strapped on their back, with bags that they're filling and carrying with dirt because they want something better for their kids. Pretty awesome. They just want something better for their kids. <clears throat> and I sat there and uh, thought, man, who's, you know, who, who's doing the great thing here? Right. Yes, they're um, showing them. Yeah. They're doing the great thing. Yeah. Um, when they're done, that building's their building. And their kids are in that building. And they better respect that yep. building. Oh, man. And you're going to go to school. You're going to be at school. Right. And, um, I mean, it, it, it was, it was, it just, it, it just moves me. So, uh, so for, uh, my kids, um, and for Connie, it's, um, they know those are the kind of things that we're doing. And even in our business, they know those are the kind of things that we're doing with, uh, with the money. And um, we've tried over the years. Uh, it's, it's harder, you know, it's harder to give when you have a bad economic year. But it's more important to give when you yeah, have Yeah, because they're economic. having it really right. bad. Yep, that's when they really need it. And so, you know, those things, have, th those are become the visions of who we are and what we're about. And we're not getting caught up in the trappings of, the, uh, you know, faster cars, bigger cars, bigger houses. We're getting caught up with uh, more, more lives being changed. And um, that's easy for, for someone like Shannon. With oh, her, well, she gives with, all her time. Yeah, I'm going to say with her heart. It gets frustrating for me. I'll be, yeah. I'll be honest. Some of my most <laughs> frustrating moments on the planet are when I come home like, where? And I, and I don't want to sound this... <laughs> Now, just even saying it out loud, yeah, I feel like I such a say Exactly. You're, you can't even. I, I know can't what even you're saying, say it. And you can't I'm like, say I don't it. even have dinner. Like, you know what I mean? And I'm like, what have you been doing? She's like, well, I was at the school and I went and helped with the, you know, as yep, a substitute. Yep, yep. And then I was at the county doing my, you know, I had a call and then I went and helped a neighbor. Like the other day, and I'm going to throw Wanda under the bus, right? <laughs> I love Wanda to death. Well, listen, Wanda's not the one we want to throw under the bus. It's Dan we want and Dan, under the bus. I love running over with <laughs> exactly. my bus, right? I love Dan to death, but he's a lot of fun to back over right right so we come back in and i'm like so shannon and so because she loves wanda so much right yeah so she's over and then angie had something so she made dinner and we're trying to go out of town like this is a flight <laughs> this isn't like we can leave when we want <laughs> right right so i'm like okay let's go we got to be there and i like to be a little bit early shannon loves to be an hour late Sure, even for a flight. So you have to run. Yeah. And then she's like, I always get on the plane. Yeah. Why are you mad? I'm like, they literally <laughs> held it because you were through the gate. Connie, Connie said to me once, you know, just once, I'd like to be able to get on a plane where they don't know my name. Yeah, well, because that's oh, Shannon. Are you the Porter family? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, we're yes, the Porter we are. Yeah, that's that's, that's okay, Shannon. So me and Shannon travel the same. Yeah. You and Connie travel yeah. the same. Yeah, I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> well, Shannon's like, well, look. I go, what are you doing? She goes, I just needed to make a really quick lemon bar for Wanda. I heard she's not feeling well. <laughs> I go, are you kidding me? You just brought Angie dinner. Like, we were going to finish that. I'm like, Shannon, you can't. And she's like, just well, shut up for a minute. I'm like, R we just brought them dinner last night. Why do we have to bring them dessert tonight? Right? Because she's sick. Because she needs a lemon Shannon. bar. What's wrong with you? Well, that's what Shannon. I'm like, Shannon. And, and I feel like a dick sometimes by just saying it out loud. But I'm like, why is it that we just give every, uh, we, 
I, yes. I just put myself in the middle of that credit. Now, the yes. only thing I gave was not losing my mind, right? Well, but, but I, I, I if your you spouse know. is giving, you can say we. <laughs> we. <laughs> I'm in here right. like, <laughs> I'm sitting in the truck idle. What are you doing? Making dinner. <laughs> Dessert. For what? For a sick person. I'm like, okay, well, you know, that's that's the unique thing we have. And, and I've been yeah. blessed with that because she is my polar opposite, which is frustrating at times. <laughs> right? That's such a blessing, right? Because, so, right, that uh, you refine her a little bit, she refines you a little bit, and together we get a pretty good pretty Yeah, we got couple, a pretty good right? couple, that's for yeah. sure. But anyway, that's what it is. So for Connie and you know, for my children, um, they're, we have, I mean, look, we live a great life. We're, we, we're, we're very grateful for what we have. But they recognize that, like, when I'm dead, they don't get the money. It's going to go help people. They're capable enough to make their own way, and I expect them to. Um, but it's going to go bless other people. I don't need a bigger house. I don't need a different car. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, You're in a great place. Yeah. We're, nice we're, we're, private yeah, area. Yeah, we're yeah. very, very happy. So... <clears throat> What do we, what can we do to help other people? That's that's always the question. So back to that, helping other people. You get these young entrepreneurs and they have these grand vision. What is your number one di di differentiator that makes you say yep or no? So I have an it. Oh. I have, you have, an, and we've talked about this, angel investing. We've talked about mm -hmm. shark investing. We've talked about product investment, people investment. When it comes down and you're involved uh, in, in several companies, but when they come down to visit with you, when you sit down to hear their pick, pitch, if you were to say, Joe Blow comes up to you and say, hey, John, I've got this concept. What is it that makes you go, yeah, I'm interested? Or Yeah, no, you know, it's super, super easy. It's almost never is it the concept. It's always the person. So you, it was easy for me to bet on you. Easy. Because I knew you would never quit. Yeah. I, I knew you would never quit. Um, you get your butt kicked and get your butt kicked and you would just get up and fight. I just knew you would never quit. And so if I have a person who has the character and the capability in that order, character and capability, then I'm going to bet on them and I'm going to find something to help them be successful. That's what we did with you. That's exactly what we did. Right? Yeah. I didn't really care what you chose. Well, when I did bring you the pitch, you go, well, to be honest with you, I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me why anybody would want a hidden door. But okay, whatever. Okay. You looked a, at that and you're like, that a, is really, that makes no sense. Yeah, you didn't want to like, be me. No, I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. But I don't, I mean, who's going to, why would you, why would anybody want that? I'm like, it's right? going to change the way it's yeah. stuff is well, stored. But, you, but, but the point is, is that you could see stuff um, that I could see. And that happens all the time. I don't care about that. I care about you. If you've got the character and you have the capability, then I'm going to, then I'm going to take a, a serious look at you. Right. That's the first thing I'm, I'm looking at. Then I'm, then I, I you know, we, we do our diligence. I'm, you know, I've got to know, you know, what's the product, where, where does it fit in the market? Um, what's the demand? What are the price points? You know, we go look at all that kind of stuff, but, but if I don't have confidence in you, you won't even look at the rest. Couldn't care less. Nope. Yeah. So if you were to say, cause I mean, you're, we approached our relationship completely different than most like when you go to find an investor, right? Whether if this is a way somebody's going to go do their startup, I had a unique opportunity that I had to go to these, you know, excuse me, venture capital jerks around the valley mm -hmm. and private equity firms that to me are just opportunities for theft in a legal way that they can still sleep at night <laughs> and go to church on Sunday and be fine. <laughs> Bottom line. How, but, how do you how feel do about that? <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing about you. I've always got to try and yeah, pull just these kind of pull the detail out of you. <laughs> well, and I think they come from a different opportunity. Like we're, we're BC and, and they celebrate it. And to me, as I've, I mean, I've literally met with almost all of these in, in the yeah. Utah Valley, in the, you know, Salt Lake city. I shouldn't say all, I don't know, but the ones that well, you know, of, the I've, major pretty, ones. Sure, yeah, I've yeah. met with them all. And yeah. I, and they're not saying, I'm not saying they're bad people, most of them, right? Yeah. There's some I would absolutely not let, you know, my friends go into business with, but I, but at the same time, um, interesting to hear their story. It's just, I, I look at it when people celebrate these rounds, and I think Utah's kind of sick right now when it comes to these celebrations of investment rounds. To me, it's, it's super odd that they're celebrating rounds of investment. It's odd to me. It, to me, when I have to go find a round, it's like groveling at a high interest credit card company for, for something. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, to me, it's a demented view and it's celebrated incorrectly. And the sales pitch they use is like, would you like a nice car? I mean, I, what would your wife think about you in a Ferrari? I'm like, my wife? 
she'd think I'm a fat guy in a little car. <laughs> like, what would my wife, let's talk about an F450 or a Dodge. I mean, I don't want to say Ford, but you know what I mean? I, I don't know what you mean by that. And they're like, wouldn't you think she'd like a big house? I'm like, no, she's not even keeping our house that clean. <laughs> Like, can you imagine if it was bigger? <laughs> yeah. You know? So uh, these, these Shannon, pitches. Shannon, I things. have an extra room for him tonight. If you <laughs> it's need false. It. <laughs> if you want to she does him. keep it pretty clean. But the point is, is it's hard enough to try to keep what we have, sure. right, in, in, a, in a manageable space. Well, here we see these giant companies, and you, you see these comments from well-renowned locals, you know, that are in that private equity and venture capital world that I follow on LinkedIn. I'm like, congratulations, so-and-so just did a $100 million round. And I'm like, you're so leaving out the most important parts. Like, how much do they give away? And how, what's their clawback clauses look like? And mm -hmm. what are you going to lose? And are they going to have anything at the end right. of the day when they finally get to market? And did they just hawk themselves for zero? How much of that $100 million went in their pocket? Four hundred grand, okay. Right? So my point is... We, we have this broken view, and I think we, we frown upon debt. As, a, as an individual, we say, don't do that. And then we all of a sudden see venture capitalists celebrated that they invested $100 million. I'm like, yeah, I get it. The value of the company is way, way up. But this poor soul, poor person, now maybe not poor at all, but I mean, they just gave away everything and hawked it to the snake oil dude. Okay. Right. Look, I probably shouldn't say it like that in front of you, but at the point is we had this different, different round. And so to me, before we go about it and we come as a young entrepreneur, this is a good opportunity for people like you and myself, I guess now that we could really skin somebody. Oh yeah. Right. And so how do you do it to where they're not skinned and they, people think it's fine if you got 80% of their business and they're going to go slave for 20 right. or 51% as you see on shark tank every day. To me, it's just a really bad, sad entry. You, now, de like, you demoralize that guy out the gate. Well, so, uh, so, so that's why, I mean, it, it took us longer. For sure, it took us longer to build our business and to build For our sure. brand, right? Because we bootstrapped it. Um, we never, any money that came back in, you know, at Connie would see our taxes and say, where, where's that money? I'm like, yeah, well, that's, uh, you know, it's in You'll this, see. Right, in this piece <laughs> yeah. of equipment, it's yeah. in this piece of equipment, it's in these people. Right. It was just always going back in and uh, it takes a long time. But we maintain by by doing that, we maintain control. Mm -hmm. And uh, to we me, haven't had to answer to anybody. Mm -mm. I was always way more interested in control than I was in speed. And I wanted to build it right. I wanted to uh, have the right culture. I wanted to um, be able to really provide a great service for our clients. Um, I wanted to be free. You know, when you look at, uh, so the, uh, we, we, uh, spun out of, uh, out of that business, we, we spun a software company, um, be clear view, by the way, got to look into it. Yeah. It's a okay. Great yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, Clearview was really, well, the, re the whole place that Clearview came from was the fact that we were competing against these massive billion dollar companies. It was always so funny. We'd go into these RFPs and there would be teams with billion dollar, you know, billion dollar companies. And they send these teams with, um, you know, really impressive people. And then my uh, buddy, Chris Cottrell and I would go in and it'd be just like the two of us. And, and uh, we, you know, and we had these little teeny company. Um, sometimes we would, uh, we, we would uh, make it. Sometimes we wouldn't, but you know, it's the same thing. The, the, the biggest client we had, he just always said, I knew I could bet on you two. I just knew, I knew if I did that, um, that you're going to do what you have to do to make it be successful, which was true. And so anyway, we couldn't afford um, any kind of software off the shelf. And so we just would always develop it. And so um, we started off with, uh, with um, you know, an Excel spreadsheet and then it, went to, uh, Johanna wrote something in, in Foxbro and, and, um, you know, and then, and then all of a sudden we ended up with a product that was giving us a competitive advantage and our clients would say, Hey, how can we get that? And that's where we're like, you know, we, we could spin this out, which we, uh, ended up doing successfully, yeah, ended up doing, but I could never have done that. If I had venture money in there, I could never have done it because no, they wouldn't have allowed us to use money in that way. And so I wanted that flexibility. I wanted to be able to have the flexibility to give money away if I wanted to and not somebody else tell me whether I could or couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I built the business is I wanted to be able to do that. And so a lot of people say, you know, uh, first make your money and then make your mark. I always thought, if I have control, I can make my mark. I, I can make a difference every day. 
mm-hmm. and I don't want somebody else uh, controlling that. So I never, we never went that way. So um, today, um, um, almost, a, um, almost, uh, um, I, I don't have any money in, in any venture rounds. My money, um, if I'm doing that, it's, it is, as you said earlier, it's angel. And um, uh, I don't think I know of a case where they're not still the majority owners. Um, yeah, it stands the case here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, have, I have a piece uh, uh, in a business uh, with people I believe in and that I admire and with a product that I think is going to make a difference. And so we help them and then we provide mentorship. And, and that's the fun of it. I mean, look, <laughs> look, I mean, if we look at, you know, uh, so Jeremy, you may not know this, but Jeremy, Jeremy's a fighter. And uh, <laughs> so, I don't know what he's saying next. <laughs> like, so uh, when when we first get, when we first got started, um, he'd get mad, and sometimes he had every right to be mad, but he'd say stuff, and I'm like, I'd say something. Yeah, uh, he would say stuff. <laughs> yeah. He would say stuff, and I'm like, dude, you can't say that. He's like our banker, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Fish off in his Velcro shoes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. you know, and I'm like, first of all, I, I love my love banker. He's like man. one of my closest friends, but you can't say that. <laughs> you know, I do love so, that guy though. Oh, oh I know. Go, right? Oh my gosh. He's one yep. of my, we had the most, when you were on your mission, <laughs> we spent three years while you were gone, just freaking armed yeah, arm with tough. old Bishop. Yeah. But you know what? It turned out wonderful. And so rather than just being myself and carving this piece out saying, okay, I'm going to do it this way. I had to learn how to adapt to what Robert's desires were to make my three years easier. Cause I realized quickly within a few months that the way I was doing it was not working very well. Yeah. Well, but that's, that was, that was going to be my point As I watched, um, <laughs> Jeremy go from, um, brilliant, but completely unpredictable, right? Not fair. <laughs> yeah. Into a businessman who is tactical strategic. I can put him in front of any group um, of investors or clients. Um, he is who he is. He's going to show up in, in uh, Wranglers and, and Boots. But he knows the data. He is cool. Um, he doesn't fly off the handle. He doesn't say things. If he says something that's, a, uh, that's off there, he meant to. Yeah, it is. Calculated. Right? Yeah, it's calculated. Um, and to watch that growth, to really watch him go from being um, a young, um, aggressive, um, unpredictable uh, founder to being really a calculated, tactical, strategic, articulate um, CEO, and that's awesome. Yeah, That's awesome. That. And so the, the money's gone up, and I'm happy about that, but that's not what it's about. Watching what's happened with your journey, dude, that's incredibly satisfying. Yeah. Well, it's, it's been fun it's to awesome. do. Yeah. But you know what's odd is is to have people like you as well as the other people we have on our board of advisors and stuff that we have, right, is to listen and take that advice to heart, which is a really, for me, that was a super hard transition, yeah. right, to get the idea of, of having the I don't know tattoo on my forehead and trying to transition to, from that well, guy. But look, to that's the, one of the big compliments to you. You didn't bring in on your board a bunch of people who were going to say, hey, "Jeremy, everything you want to do, we're going to let you do." You brought in a, a um, guy. It says the opposite, right? They're ex- <laughs> they're experts in. I mean, they're real experts. Yeah. And they're like, "No, Jeremy, you, that's not right. You need to be doing this." And and uh, and to your credit, some. Sometimes you adapt what they said, but a lot of times you're like, gee, I don't think I just I don't think so. But you go home, you think it out, you work your way through, and then you make your decision, and we all support it. Uh, but it puts you in a position where the decisions you make are much stronger because you've surrounded your people yourself with people who know more than you know about lots of different things, and they push you. So sometimes we end up with better decisions because we do what they said, but. Lots of times we end up with a better decision because you took what they said and you continued to take what you thought and somehow we came out synergistically with a much better outcome. Mm-hmm. And um, it's been, uh, that's a real compliment uh, to you and how you go about your business. I think that's a key. So these are some of the skill sets as an early entrepreneur that I wished I would have learned earlier mm-hmm. is is to lean on the people that have been there and find mentors early. I mean, that's kind of cliche, but truly to find a mentor with, the true heart of finding a mentor 
with the idea of like helping them keep you from going down the dirt road that would be really a lot longer and harder than if you just followed a couple little key points that they could maybe give you and you find a few people that might be in those same points and not to be too prideful in saying, dude, I am totally screwed up right here. Like, well, how would you, how would you circumvent this? Yeah. I mean, right? dude, you've had some of the biggest, uh, uh, that's one of the amazing things you, uh, you're not afraid to ask. And you've had some of the biggest names in the state as far as uh, uh, growth companies goes um, in your shops, looking at things and, and on your board. I mean, um, uh, Don. Uh, yeah, amazing. I mean, where are you going to find somebody that, that is more, uh, that understands that business better and, and a Bill Hamblin. And, you know, I mean, you've got these guys that are, uh, that that really are are uh, extraordinary. That anybody well, would, worldwide, yeah, that would right. be anybody would be thrilled to have on their board. Home Depot was, yeah. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> they were thrilled. Yeah, with it. exactly. And here we have have <clears> them <throat> sitting on the board of this little company, but um, it's because you were willing to ask, and um, uh, they liked you, and they liked what you were doing, and and now look, right, and everybody's better for it. They have fun with it. And your business is uh, so much better because you have been wise enough to surround yourself with really smart people. And, um, and you don't just do what they say. You listen to them, but then you work until you find a solution that you think is the optimal solution. And I think, that's, uh, I think that's the ideal, and I think that's rare. So I wanted to add one more thing when you say this, and it's kind of going back to the previous conversation with the uh, equity components and giving stuff back. John's one of the very few opportunists that gave me an opportunity to get up there. He had 33% of, at one point and he allowed it, not without an argument, but with a good argument, he allowed me to buy it back down and then he came back and bought back up. Yeah. So, but any, anybody that I would work with, to me, those are the type of relationships and that's the type of conversation I'd have. I'd be like, look, if there's an opportunity that I can buy you down, would you let me do that. And I would be careful of the people that say no, right? Because if the right investor, the right guy that believes in you and isn't there for the wrong reasons would say, you know what, if you pull this off and you can, I would love to see you do it. Right. That's what we came yeah. down with you. That's right. And, and so for us, it should be a two way shopping street. Just don't be so growly that you have to take whatever money you can get. Try to be patient because it'll work out for the better if you are, but find somebody that if they are, if you do have to reach to where you're finding an equity partner, that they give you an opportunity, even if you can't ever get there, but they're at least willing to listen to your opportunity to buy back at a reasonable rate, right? That's a really hard thing to find in those type of people like you. You're a rarity in one in a million, which most people are going to say no. But it, the way I want to set myself up in those conversations in the future is to do exactly that. I think you end up with a better partner not just on the investment investor side but the the invest the person you're investing in gives them motivation differently <clears throat> to to hit it like they're like you know what he is letting me buy them back at this certain rate and i am going to work so freaking hard to make sure i can do that because i do appreciate his investment but i do want to have as much as i can of my own yeah. company that i'm sweating for and my blood sweat and tears I mean, it's really wise of John to do this in the hindsight because you, you're able to say, you know what? Okay, if you want to do that, that's fine. It's we lift all waters and at a, at a multiplier, right? So if you look at someone and you you put all this money into them and you say no, you can't, then you've kind of just taken a lot of the wind out of their cell, and you're going to get this maybe not. I'm not going to say 100 mm -hmm. percent time, but a slower rise. Uh, you know, uh, the, the statement you said to me is that I may be dying, but I will drag you over the finish line. I promise I will get you there. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I've always, uh, uh, that uh, comes back again to. Oh, this is my racehorse analogy. I remember yeah. the conversation. Yeah. yeah. And it comes back to, um, am I betting on the idea or the company um, or am I betting on the person? Am I, um, am I betting on, am I in this for, um, money or am I in this to see, uh, to see some real growth in the, in a business in, uh, and it's okay to person. be both. Right. Yeah. But I think you should bet well, more on the person cause it'll give you the money well, faster. For me. Well, that's right. That's yeah. my point is that, is that I, uh, I thought, you know, um, I can argue with, continue to argue, uh, with you about this, uh, which is not an awesome thing. <laughs> um, or, um, you know, uh, Jeremy is, 
deeply committed to this, and um, this is really important to him. And it's gonna, it'll, it'll end up working out, and it did. It's worked out. It's worked out in a remarkable for, way, right? For for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's why I think it's really important that we understand why we're doing what we're doing. And um, I'm not uh, for me. I'm not caught up with. Um, you know, I expect my investments to go well. I mean, I don't want to act like I'm it's all well, altruistic. Yeah. I expect the businesses to go well. Um, I wouldn't put money in if I didn't think the expect it was going to grow. We're going to go well, um, but because I'm not uh, caught up in uh, quarterly reports, then we have time. No, he wants them every Friday. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Just <right. kidding. laughs> Then we then we have time to work with people, and we have time to let things grow, and we're not always. You know, that adage, you're not always pulling up the flowers to check the roots. You know, we things have time to grow. That's a good one. And um, it's, uh, and, and I think I think too often in our business world, uh, I think there's lots of people who fell that in a different, in, in a more, um, uh, in, in a environment the way we're talking, they could be successful. Um, but uh, if you're in some of those uh, uh, more aggressive, uh, with some of those more aggressive funds, they don't have the time. They don't have the patience because they made these promises to their investors. To their investors, yeah. so they don't have the time and the patience. And so, um, both you and I, I think, in our own businesses as well as the ones we do together, that um, uh, we benefited from that. So, if you were to go out and say to a young entrepreneur, and you would say, "Okay, here, here's the different methods," and I and I talked about this. You can do, you can have your own money, right? That you've saved. You could pull from your retirement, which is, you know, quasi your own money. Mm -hmm. You could use your own personal line of credit or credit debt or credit card debt if you want. Then you could go to your family, which is hard. And then yeah. we talk about how do you pay them and do you give them equity and do you do payments and how do you make it so you can eat dinner on Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner together without making it weird because you're driving a Ferrari and they don't got, they haven't been paid back. Right. Yeah. And I mean, hypothetically, most or, you just lost, never get or they gave you money that was hard to give and then they, and they lost never it. got and they lost mm -hmm. it. So how do you have that? And then after outside of that, then you go to your influences. Right. So I go to actually you came to me. So thank goodness. But the other way is like you'd reach out to um, the neighbors or friends and family. How do you how do you do those investments? Or next you look for outside investors. So there's all those different leverage components that you can use to come up with money. And there's always one better than the other. And for my sake, I'd say it's much better to have your very own money if you can and bootstrap it rather than, um, I, I, I have a problem with companies that come up with these huge rounds to start because I feel like they use the money to plug the hole rather than ingenuity and effort and time and just hard work, right? They just keep getting these ginormous rounds. I'm like, where are you putting a hundred million dollars? Right. Like, do you realize how many, uh, you guys are just trying to plug a leaky hole with a bunch of cash. And all you're doing is ripping the hole open bigger. You're not even coming up with the solution to fix the hole. Like if you were having to bootstrap it and do it with a nickel versus, you know, $5 million, how would you do it? You'd lose the ability to create or be creative when you overfund something sometimes. Right. And it's hard to say that for somebody that's looking for money. Like, oh, you overfund. I mean, you're going to argue with me. It's fine. But I'm just saying there's opportunity there to be creative and think differently than I just need to plug the hole with some cash. Yeah, look, if you're in a fund... Um, it's calculated that a certain number of those businesses are going to fail. Sure. And sometimes it's still a reasonable business. They're like, no, we're not giving you more money. We're done because you can't hit the growth rate. You can't keep up. It isn't that there it couldn't be an ongoing concern if it was, uh, uh, if they had a different funding choice, but sometimes it's like, you can't keep up. You're not hitting the marks. And so we're done with you. Close right? it. Yeah. So we're done. Goodbye. Right. And I don't fault them. That's how they, that's how they run their business. But you man, make hamburgers, they make their yeah, money that way. That's yeah. right. And if you're going to get in that, all I ever say to people, if you're going to take venture money, man, you just better know the rules because their rules are different and they have different objectives. And, uh, but man, if I can, you know, if I can uh, get one, one divvy or one snap or, you know, uh, that, that, it's a whole I mean, different world for yeah, the investor, the, the, right? Yeah. So, I mean, like so a small what, business that fails is like wasted food on a on a food yeah, restaurant. Yeah, they just it they goes just, in the garbage. Yeah, it just expired. goes in the garbage. They don't care. <clears throat> well, but so so I'm not telling anybody they shouldn't go the venture round. I'm just telling you it's a different game, and you better know the game. So, if you yeah. were brand new, John Porter, I'd never do that with fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah. Tell me how you would what your startup steps would look like. Well, what I'll I can look. I can only tell you. I what can you only did tell you what I did. And right? how would you do different yeah. now? 
So um, I uh, I had um, that uh, that money um, that allowed me um, to uh, secure a very small line of credit. They took my they took all my money, and they gave me a line of credit of uh, I don't remember. Robert could tell you I think it's fifty thousand dollars or something. But they took my money to secure it and they locked it up. And then we started off with the, the these this little phone bank and and we had a and you know we had an ACD and and I rem- I remember my first my first phone bill came in and it was like eight hundred and eighty dollars and I was like holy cow it's eight hundred it's almost a thousand dollars on the phone bill not knowing you know that um, in the future it'd be uh, one more zero dollars yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, right you know and. Um, but, but that's how we did it. And, and uh, um, you know, I figured out if I could have, like if you're going to make money, you either have to have a scarce resource, um, land or a gold mine, or I, uh, you know, you're a, sur- you're, you're a surgeon. Right? Those are scarce resources. That's why they make money. Well, uh, I didn't have any scarce resource. So the only other way to do it is to duplicate, right? right. You have to be able to find something profitable and be able to duplicate it. Right, so for me, if I can make one um, employee um, a successful, profitable entity for a company, then could I make two? And if I can make two, could I make four? If I can make four, could I make eight? And can we build a team? And I got two teams. Can I do? Can I do four teams? Can I do? Okay, now I got a site. Can I do two sites? And that's how we grew. So for us, every time we grew, it was a new learning curve. Right. Well, the same way it was for you. Um, how long is it? You know. Uh, Oh my gosh, we've got like 20, we, we got 12 doors we got to get done. <laughs> right? Now we do that in an hour. <laughs> right? You know, like, right? Like, it was 12 doors. Like, holy cow, right? How are we going to do that? And you start, right? You start looking well, at Well, even our this. suppliers were saying, we can't do that many. You're oh, going to have right? to look at another solution. Yep. After we sold them. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. We're like, oh, this ain't good. Yeah, that's not that's a problem. And poor John's on this side. What are you going to do? I'm like, so few hundred grand we're talking just a small little bit (laughs) like are you okay if we go buy this right yeah we can make it work so so and you would just address those and you'd move along and we and so er, when you do that every every point of growth is a different learning curve and so So did you have problems with designs you got a fifty thousand dollar round and then to try to push that limit i remember one time yeah one one time it was actually we don't we were new and um uh, we had, and I didn't, there was a, there was a clause and there was a clause that said I, I had to have a resting period for 30 days. I mean, it had to be a zero. And uh, my man, I was, I was so mad at Robert because Robert on my first day. He wasn't day, clear about that. Well, but the first thing I was maddest about was that I didn't need it the first 30 days. And he said, I'll oh, throw some, you know, you might as well put that on there. And I put on, I don't know, I put on some ridiculous thing, you know, some chairs and a desk or something. And uh, I didn't need to do it. Well, after I'd been in a year, it was a lot harder, right? Because I, I had some You'd money on it, there. You'd used it. Yeah. And I had to, but it had to rest for 30 days. And so I had to, uh, uh, I, had to I didn't have any of my own money at that point because I already put it all in. Um, so. Um, so uh, that's called a secured line of credit in a quasi, yeah, right? right? So I, I put in uh, my 15000 So Chris had to put in 8000 And I went to my dad and said, can I get a loan? He gave me a loan for 32000 um, and we paid it off, got it at 30 days. And then, but I, I remember it was, uh, 14 months later, I gave him his check back with interest for your dad, for my dad to say, you know, uh, th- thank you. Um, but that wasn't going to be a grant. That was going to be a loan. It was important for us to be independent. We needed, we needed, but people forget that. that. I think the sad part about this is we take advantage of our family first too. We'll borrow from them first. But then we take advantage of that too, and I'm guilty. I've well, been there because we before. don't have to give it back. They're not going to forget. They're not yeah, taking, they're not taking my house, house right? But so, how do you keep yourself it, into that moral check? Well, That's the issue. Well, because it's important. It's important for you to have the mentality that I am independent. It's important to have the mentality that that I can uh, that I uh, can meet these obligations. And look at my family at you, dinner. Well, be, well, the problem is, is it, <clears throat> it doesn't matter where you start. Uh, where, where you start the slide, but if I don't have to pay my dad back and then do I have to do this? And do I have to do this? And that's where people get themselves in moral dilemmas. And uh, it's important that you meet your obligations because then you, there's no, there's no slide. 
and you maintain your moral integrity. You don't get yourself in those moral dilemmas. And no one knows that moral integrity but you. That's and that's right. the hardest part. That's right. So just remember to keep your moral compass square. It's a hard one. It's easy to justify your failure on some of those. And I've oh, been yeah. there. Like yeah, I, yeah. I have done it. I be, I'm not saying I'm not pointing fingers at others. It is a, from my own experience of saying, I'll just wait on those guys. And then you're yeah. right. Cause then it'll be like, well, so sister, grandma, brother, whoever, I don't have a brother, but you know, you're, you're going back saying, no, it's okay that they, they understand. They understand I lost everything uncle. Right. Yeah. So you can go through these things and then you go back and you, you justify, well, they took a bet. They knew what the bet looked like. Yeah. Right. Right. It's easy to write it off. Like they would have had the same thing happen in the stock market. So why do I have to be different than the stock market? And you know why? Cause you just are. Well, that, well, that's why you got. You're decide. supposed to be different that's right. than the stock. That's why you got to decide who you're going to be. So, you know, I've had a couple of uh, a couple of times with uh, different partners, investors, where, um, uh, you know, legally, um, according to the contracts, I didn't have to pay them back, but I did anyway. And it doesn't mean you can't chew on your lip. Yeah. Oh right? no. Right. Oh yeah. You, but you can still be mad about it. Yeah. But you still don't want to put your moral compass in. That's right. In question. Yep, that's right. right. I don't want to have out there um, anything about my reputation, and it's not worth that to me. There was some, yeah. there's two things. One, for me, and I say this all the time, I said hard enough, sleep is hard enough for me to come by. <laughs> like, I just can't sleep. I don't sleep. I've taken yeah. Ambien for 20 plus years. I do not enjoy sleep. I don't like bedtime. I crash. I don't go to bed. Yeah. Like, I just don't like it, right? So I, the last thing I need is something that keeps me awake, like, oh, why do I have to think about John or whoever, right? <laughs> right. No, it's it, true. Th th I don't need something else keeping me right. awake. So I, it's really stuck with me on everything. We When we make decisions here, and like you said, you know for a fact, I'll just keep going until the end. That's right. It's because I did what I, I'm going to do what I said because I've spent so many years of my life not, right? Just not doing what I said. Yep. I would say I've, I've done enough of that. And now it's like, look, I know how, and here I am 20 years later, still struggling with sleep. Right. And so you try to put those bears to bed and you want to address them one at a time. And you, you, you try to plug and fix those bad things that happened or that you've done or how you wronged people. And some of them have passed. So you left with these skeletons that you can't put to bed. So now I'm like, I'm not going to have those anymore to the best of my ability. Right. 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 So, you know, I hear people say, uh, you know, somebody got caught for fraud, some embezzlement or something. The next question people inevitably ask was how much, how much did it take? It's irrelevant. No, and I always say, I say, well, so at what dollar amount are you cool with it? Right? When, <laughs> when, when, when does it make sense? Oh, he got a million bucks. It made sense. I see why he did that. Right? <laughs> you know, no, um, it doesn't matter what the, it doesn't matter. Um, either we do or we don't. And that doesn't mean we're perfect. We do our best. And sometimes there's misunderstandings and, and whatever, but we do our best to make sure that we are doing what we say we will do and be who we um, mean to be. And, that's what. That's one reason I love working with you. Is you are who you are. Um, I, I you'll, you'll never tell me a story. You, I always know the truth. Um, you are. I mean, you are. Well, my memory sucks. So if I told you a story, yeah. I can't remember the same story no, twice. No, you don't. I always get the truth from you. And if it's not good news, you'll tell me. You'll tell me it's not good news. And uh, um, if it's, uh, you know, if if it's something that you don't like, I'll. You'll tell me. And. Yeah. I can deal with that. I can't deal with the uh, thing with, I can't I wonder deal what with, he's thinking. Yeah. I can't deal with, uh, with falsehoods. Can't, I mean, you can't, what, what are you supposed to do with that? But I also can't deal with a problem that I don't know exists. And so the openness in the relationship is one of the things that, uh, has made it so, uh, so successful and easy to work with. Yeah, well, absolutely. Don, I was going to say back to that other thing. He, he made a point. Like we go through these warranty arguments and then these customer dispute arguments and some are 500, you know, $500 to call it $5,000. And you know, you're right. Like these people have the door and they're right. taking advantage of whatever it is. And I'm sitting there like, Don, what do you want to do? He goes, just write it off. I'm like, just write it off. I go, don't you think we should sue him? I mean, this, he's like, no, he's like, that is yesterday. How are you supposed to be growing? If you're going to look at yesterday, just move on. Yeah. I'm like, but Don, like there's nothing wrong. They're just disputing the card and they're not answering the phone. Like, don't you think we should do something about it? He goes, and, and we do it. There's times now that we have different systems yeah. than when we first started with Don Blum, right? Blum, I should say. Uh, I, I look at it. And I'm like, you know what? It's really helped me get past it. 
I, and I think Ken, you've seen us as we make these decisions, like just give them their money back. It's not worth their hatred towards us and my hatred towards them. They just didn't get what they expected. And, and then the other side, you have people that get way over what they expected. And they're like, man, oh my gosh, this is, this is, most people don't treat people like this that well. Why was it so, I mean, like sometimes our counter offer, like, hey, I got a scratch door. I'm like, oh, I'm really sorry. Um, let me get you a new door and another hundred dollars or whatever we might offer to get that fixed. Like, no, like it's just happened here. Like, you don't need to do that. Why would you do that? And it's just, I think sometimes we try to take that customer service level to a different, different point. And I think with, with life in general, as we mark those off and we're able to put those little demons to bed a little bit easier, we can always look forward instead of just spending all our time backward, which is like you're saying, That's people right. that are living in the right now have a large, hard time looking for the future. Well, it's even worse for people that are living in the rear view mirror. Right. Well, <clears throat> look, so, so in the first place, there is, there is this principle of, and you can call it karma or whatever, uh, that, that'll come back to them. That's their problem. Um, but you don't have time because what you said early on, and um, you and I both are optimists this way, and that is that generally speaking, the, the vast majority of people in any culture of any color of any um, uh, other um, defined group are good. They're easy. And they're well-intended. Doesn't mean they do everything right, but generally they are. And so if you work from that premise, then there's some people that are going to take advantage of you, but most people aren't. And we try to do the right thing for those people. And so those people you're never going to make happy and oh well. So we tell my people, right? what do we use all the time, Kevin? We're not the moral police. That's yeah. what I say. I, we're not the moral police. We're not in charge if they can sleep at night. The only thing I care about, you know, I'll use Beth, for example, is Beth that you can. That's right. Did we do right for our customer? Yes. Do you feel better about the way we treated our customer than the way the customer is treating you? Yes. Okay, do what makes you sleep good. We don't need to sit there and be the moral police. And, you know, she'll come back. And I love Beth because she's such a great, you know, internal sales and customer service rep. She's a wonderful person. She just, but she's like, well, look, they're, ta they're taking advantage of us. I'm like, okay fine do you do we want to be the moral police or are we just going to go ahead and what's going to keep you what's going to make it so you can go to bed so you can close the file do you want to just close it let's just close the file you can't make everyone happy yep you know and and i think where we spend our time is a is a, where where we end up like the success of your business is a great reflection of where you've spent your time if you're spending your time on just trying to fight and prove yourself right you'll never grow you're just going to spend that time forever because you are going to have an unha unhappy customer, one out of 100, two out of 100, whatever it may be. But if you're going to spend 100% of your time on two people, then your growth has now stopped. So for these young guys, you were saying how you got your stuff oh, rolling. I keep getting going. off on that. No, yeah. no, you're fine. I just, I love that because it's exactly kind of the next step of business, right? And finding the right team players and, and how do you think of it? Because I mean, right now when you first start, you're a single hat wearer and, and you had a partner and you guys probably chose different roles. Your background is accounting, super great at helping us see that, right? That's where your, most of your background sits. Yep. And so you, you look at it for these young entrepreneurs and we think about, uh, what kind of business are we going to operate and how do I, how do I trust? Right. And I think the, we talked about this in an earlier segment, like trust is a segment. It's one of the most important components for me. It's the number one piece for growth is if I can't trust you, we can't go anywhere. That's right. Trust is it. It trust to the vendor, trust to the customer, trust to my, to everyone around me. So otherwise I can't scale at all. Right. If I can't trust, I can't empower. I can't, there's that several right. phases of, of this. And, it is the hardest one to say, I trust you with my livelihood, my money, my business. Like, I'm never going to let you do this. You can do checks and balances. Like, I do not write checks. Sandra does not sign checks. Yeah. We can't do either. She's in the hospital. She's been in the hospital since last week. We didn't cut checks Friday because there's nobody to cut checks. Right? Sorry. I, people are like, hey, we need to get a check cut. We never do this. We have a great enough relationship with our banks or with our vendors that they understand while she's in the hospital. They don't, I don't write checks. I don't even have a key to the check drawer, as dumb as that sounds. No. But it's a check and balance, right? And we made an agreement early on, like Sandra, you don't sign checks. And Jeremy, you won't write checks. So that way I don't have to wonder where money's going. Like, did you take check number whatever? Doesn't happen, right? 
So that that's okay. But she'll be back. I think she's out now. But she'll be back, and we'll cut them and catch everybody else up. So the the problem is you can have a check and balance, but if you can't trust, you're stuck at you. No, that's right. Checks and balances are important, but the but checks and balances keep honest people honest, right? If you don't trust somebody, if they're not honest, there isn't, you can't put in a check and balance that's going to correct that. And so if you have that situation, that has to be solved now. How ironic. You hear this from your managers. Well, I don't know. Do we want to trust that? Like, do I trust this to get out in these managers, the great managers at times that you see these abilities? And we've had these conversations. Jeremy, one CEO too big for you, right? For this company. Is this outgrown your ability? And maybe, I mean, and, you know, gracefully enough, you said, no, not yet. Yeah, not yet. But at the same time, you, you look at some of our managers, even on the day-to-day business that they don't want their guys. They have to look at everything their guys are doing. I'm like, you got to stop it. You only have eight hours a day. And if I'm going to get bigger than your eight hours a day and, and you can't get all these things done, there's a, there's a, a puddle over here of doors. What's the matter? Why well, didn't get through them all? Well, why are you getting through them all? Why haven't you empowered your people to get through them? All? Well, you know, I, I can't trust them to make sure. Well, then now we're stuck at you. Like we're only as big as eight hours a day that you're going to give us. Correct. Regardless of how big our company is. I mean, we're pushing a hundred people here right between all our between here in Kentucky now we're just shy and uh if if it's stuck to Riley's eight hours and I'm not using Riley because he's not the person I'm talking about but um if we're stuck to Riley's eight hours or, or Bill's eight hours then we can have a hundred people pushing doors through and we have to wait for Bill to sign them all off yeah right it's not it Can't doesn't do happen it. Nope. and and people have these aspirations to be big but they want to have full control it, you can't do both no nope. yeah it's a skill set you have to learn but to find the right people that you can trust and to let go of that baby, believe me, is a really hard thing. I'm sure you experienced it too, as you had the direct relationships with science yeah, yeah. early on yeah, and you yeah, saw yeah. focus get to where it's at today. I can only imagine letting someone approve your phone bill. I saw it. It gets delivered in bankers boxes. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen them. You know, you know why we that used to do AT&T that? That was your AT&T bill. Yeah. You know why we used to do that? We used to do that. That's because it goes back to when we didn't have any money and I didn't want to pay for paper. And so I'd, uh, I'd have them deliver our phone bill in paper. They're like, seriously? Yep. I want it in paper. And then we would use that through the printer. That's how that's, that was the paper we would use internally wow. um, because uh, we didn't have any money to, uh, uh, we were still bootstrapping. Right? Sure. But so, see how creative you yeah, can get things. Like or that. you could have got a million dollar round and plugged holes and gave half your company around and yep. bought paper. <laughs> yep, absolutely. I mean, let's just get creative, yeah, right? right? So I, I don't know. I just think you, we, we fumble upon ourselves as entrepreneur. We want to be able to be, you know, a new business owner. Some strive to be but small. That's that's why you have, uh, you know, when you look at the growth of a company, um, entrepreneurs have to give, give up. Uh, um, they have to be willing to give up time to managers because um, they want everything done the way they have always done it. And nobody's, most people can't do it the way the entrepreneur did it. Um, that's what's made them brilliant. And you have to turn that over to managers and professionals, and then they have their area, and then it moves up into uh, a new level of expertise. And it, it, that's what the growth curve looks like. Very few entrepreneurs can carry it all the way through to a billion dollars. Yeah, Most people have... Um, you know, I work with a company from 100 million to 250 million. I work with a company from here to a billion. I work, I do startups, right? Very few people can take it from start to a billion dollars. They're, they're such different skill sets. Some people can do it, but very few people can. And do I don't know it. if I'd want to. Well, I don't know if I'd want to be in the billion. I couldn't, level. I can't do that. It's not my skill set. Yeah. It, it's to me that corporate structure of the disciplines of just these departments that are just not interesting to me. I mean, I'd be fine, like, I, I guess, being a shareholder of a company that looks like that. Well, you might be able to do it, but what I know about you, I know you'd be unhappy doing it because right. you're creative. Um, it's not a matter of, of uh, replication and, and controls um, for you. It's a matter of, of ideas and growth. And so you'd be in a different, you know, you're in a different category. I'll be down in the lab, like... Yeah with dirty wranglers on and worn out. Well, but if you watch a lot of those guys, uh, they end up in R and D. They end up taking over R and D because. Oh really? Yeah. So, um, because that's where it made them great. Even, you know, if you look at the, uh, at the guys who are, um, you know, the classics, uh, Steve jobs, um, he was the president, but he was still always in R and D. He'd still always come back and that's, that's not, that should be more simple. That should be more elegant. That should be more, 
right? And then he'd mess, well, Elon, him, he'd mess the them all up, way. and then he'd leave. And then he'd come back and mess them all up, and then he'd leave. Um, that, that's, what, that's what made Jobs so frustrating to work for. No matter it was you, never nailed. Yeah, well, no matter what you did, um, we can make that better. I believe when you say I've nailed it, give us this hard hat of not letting new information into your head. Like yeah. I've already nailed it. My customer's wrong. My R and D people are wrong, or everybody's Whatever. wrong because I'm I'm right. This is nailed. Like if you don't look at it, it's like there is always room for improvements. And when and and you should as a as a founder or an inventor or a, an entrepreneur, you should be passionate enough and you should love your product that you feel like it's pretty darn good. Yeah, but to, if you get to the point where I'm not even listening to you because it's the best there is, then then we're well, probably running but, into problems. But look, if that's happened, um, you fell in love, uh, you fell out of love with the product and fell in love with the the business. Yeah, right. You that never happens to you because you love the product. You're no, always out like on the, the floor. You, no, you 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 totally you get jazzed by going out on the floor and you get jazzed at looking at stuff and trying to come up with a new idea and, and improving this process and getting rid of this puddle here and. I mean, that's what you, you love that. Um, people who my product is, is my product. They're over here. They're in the, they're in the counting house counting money and uh, they're up on stage. Which will be short live. Yeah. Short-lived. Right. They're, they're up on stage. They're up on um, the guys. That, that's what made jobs jobs is no matter how big they were, he was still in hated love with the product. Yeah, he loved the product, but he hated wanted hated it, stagnant. Yeah, right? that's right. That's why he was always in there because he always wanted to make it better, no matter what it was. It was he sp- he was in there. So I guess I mean the long and short of this stuff as we go through our business mindset is is money isn't impossible to find. There's ways to get it done, but being fair to your own moral compass is one of the most important things that you could be. Yeah. Whether the money came from your your you as an individual, your four hundred one k, your immediate family, brother, sister, mom, dad, your neighbor, right, the bank. Either way, as long as you don't try to make moral compass adjustments to justify why we're shorting ourselves, that'll keep your comp- your your position and your your direction of your business heading the right way. Right. And then when you take product and you, or you take a company and you start to build it, we trust, right? We trust others. We empower others. We believe in others and we help others get in a direction that we want yeah. our, our end to go. And then always ever changing. Look, uh, I think that's exactly right. I mean, er- every form of funding has it. I and mean, we didn't spend the time on here. We should have, but every one of them has pluses and minuses. VC has, there's pluses and minuses to it. There's pluses and minuses to private equity. There's pluses and minuses to angel investors. There's pluses and minuses to debt, right? You have to figure out what's going to fit you. That's my, a good way to put it. My caution is don't get enamored by the hype around a particular form. That's be, advertisement. That's all they're that's doing right. when they hype that's it That's right. It's just saying. Hungry. You be smart, be wise, and be calculated because whatever the promises are, I promise there's hooks. You, you, you in know. every in every way. Yeah, Your credit right. card debt. That's right. Yeah. So you better make sure you're going to get hooks, so you better make sure you can live with the hooks you get. So don't get excited about the dollar. Read the documents, understand that's, it if you don't know, right. Yep. right? As long as you know the deal and people get concerned about contracts. I am a handshake guy. You are a handshake yep. guy. I don't care what you do, do what you say. That was what you told me. And I use it every day. Like that is an important method, but it doesn't change the fact at the end of the day, people will still give you contracts and you need to do the that's same right. at some level or some point. But when you do, make sure that you're not the one trying to understand the mumbo jumbo garbage that we fell asleep in trying to review two days ago. Bless Craig Frame's most <laughs> boring job heart, right? Like, but he he appreciated the fact that John says, "Dude, if I had to shoot, if I had to do this job every day, I'd sleep twenty hours a day because that is just so exhaustingly boring, <laughs> right?" But it, the fact is, is because of that, we need to make sure we empower the right people to look out for us and find someone we trust pay the little bit of money up front. And I believe when we first started, John, the large majority of your initial round, which was originally 20 and then it got up into the 70, was attorneys. Steve Reinhardt got the first like $5,500 of our 20,000 and the rest went to the builder show. Yeah. Right, like to build our booth and then do the show. That was our first round. That had to start. That was our start. So, but again, 25% of our initial round of money went to law, went to legal to make sure what we were doing was right. And that was on your advice, not my own, simply to make well, sure what we were doing is in the right way. But you way. look at all the IP. I mean, no, who, th- who thinks about intellectual property associated with a door? You don't. Right? You do. Right. Because this isn't a door. 
Yeah. Right? It's not a door. That's why you have so many patents associated with it because it's not a door. Right. Right? It does things that nobody else can do, and that's why it is what it is. Um, I'll mention one other thing um, where I thought you were going to go. Okay. Attorneys and accountants um, are all paid to tell you no. And so don't ask them for their advice. Don't ask them yes or no. You have to make that decision. You have to be able to, uh, otherwise you'd never grow. Uh, You're uh, right. That is something you've told me over and over. Yeah. Like their job is to say no, because I'd get mad at Brian Tesh. Bless yeah. his heart, but he were gone. Yeah. And I'd have to go to Brian. You're like, well, go talk to Brian about it. I'm like, hey, hey Brian. <laughs> All he says is no. Right. Like he doesn't even have another answer. And yeah. you're like, well, that's what I pay him for. Right. Like that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Their whole job is to tell you no, because um, if you take a risk, if they tell you yes, and you take the risk and it doesn't work, then, they can't say uh, then it's on so. them. Yeah. But if they say no and you did it anyway, well, you're on your own, Yeah. right? So learn, really work them. Okay, well, no, but why? What are your concerns? What, how, what's the risk? How do we mitigate the risk? What are our, if I did it, what are my options? Really learn what's in their head about the issue, and then you make the decision. You have to take the risk away from them. It's not their fault. That's that's how that's what they're taught. That, well, that's how yeah, that's how they work. So it's not their fault. That's how that's that's how their world is. Mm -hmm. But if you can extract the information out of their head, then you can make a wise decision about how to mitigate the risks and how to move forward. Mm -hmm. And um, and that makes you better. Um, but just know they're always going to tell you no. Yeah. And I think we, we need to re we need to appreciate it. It's hard for somebody that was stubborn like me to hear all these answers all the yeah. time. No, especially because we have this mission and mindset that we're going that way. And you keep telling me no and you throw these blocks in my way. So then I just get angry. And then I think part of this learning journey for me has been, Jeremy, breathe. I pay him to tell you no, right? Re-ask the question differently. And, and I had to go back and I had to, I mean, for three freaking years, yeah, I had Tesh, right? Well, a good majority of those three years. And it was a hard deal because, I mean, you have these goals and I felt like it was kind of a pullback, which it was. But at the same time, it just made me have to learn how to take that no and ask the right questions to see how it was. And then I went to Cincinnati to pitch it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was kind of the deal. Um Anyway, the, the journey is insanely great. And I think the, what makes it more interesting is the right people in your court. Yeah. Right. Of course, the wrong people in your court can be interesting. I just don't know if it's the kind <laughs> yeah. of interest right. we yeah. want. No. Right. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know. What, if, for you, if you were out there and looking at other people and these young entrepreneurs, how would you say this is this is what I would do? This is the positives and the negatives of what I what I would say. Or for you? I mean, how would you tell someone? Oh, no, that's exactly what I try to do. I try to be fully transparent. This, this is what I see good about you or about, about your business or about what you're doing. These are the things that concern me. I don't hide those things. I want them to know what they are because I want to know how they're going to respond to those things. Are they going to get defensive? Like if you've got somebody who's defensive and they're not willing to learn, I don't, I don't want to work with you. Right. I don't care how smart you are. Um, but if you don't want to, uh, if you're going to be defensive and you want to learn, uh, that's for me, that doesn't work. I want somebody who wants to learn, wants to know why. And even though they may be right, fine, listen, understand what it is. And then let's, let's talk about it. But, but I, I, I want, I want somebody who wants to learn. And so I want to lay those things out. I want to have them right in front of them and I want to see how they respond to it. And then from there, I have the ability to mentor and to grow. And, uh, you know, I don't ever put my money in without some operate with me or somebody like Graham who's going to um, do uh, the mentorship. That's one of the nice things. One of the nice things we do with our angel stuff is oftentimes we'll trade um, our development, um, uh, software development for equity in their position. But if that ever happens, Graham or me or somebody sitting on the board so that we can make sure that the, the, the trajectory is right, that we're helping them along the way. Um, we, we don't uh, uh, put 10 in a, uh, you know, have, have 10 companies we put money in and then expect, uh, nine, just wait. Yeah, nine, nine gonna... of them are going to fail and one of them is going to go. Um, you need we, at least 50. Uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah. Right. I, I want, uh, we, we don't take them unless we expect them to be successful. No, I don't expect them all to go be explosive, but we better play them. higher than the bank. Yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> right. I mean, we expect them, we expect them to be successful and, uh, we, uh, we get in and get our hands dirty to help them be successful. 
the uh, and I don't know if this is a platform you'd want, but if what type of businesses do you look for in your world? What is the on your investment rounds? Does do you even care really, or do you look at specifics that you you get kind of get more entertained with than others? Oh, you know, yours is more um, tech right now. We're more tech because we're doing more software. Right, right. We're we're trading software development form, but you know, uh, one of the uh, you know an example is one of the great companies uh, that we work with is uh, is called Savvy, and basically, um, so Brock Weeks and uh, some guys they bought a, a traditional um, business security um, business, and uh, but they've brought come in now, and completely redefined it. Um, brought in all kinds of analytics, provide marketing information um, as, you know, so you still have security as the base, but now they're pulling all kinds of data around that. And um, so essentially for the same price of security, I, I get... So you're talking like an ADT security platform? Yes. Okay, good. Yes, 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 excuse me. Yeah, so, um, you know, I have 15 locations and I want those locations to have alarm systems. Well, they take the cameras, they take the data and built software around it so that now I can give information back to the, to the owners about these are, this is who's coming in your store. And this is how, this is the activity. This is when they come and this is, and this is where they're going in the store. And, and, um, he built great software so that, um, people have a, a better experience when they go in and, and, uh, owners have more information on how to be able to help them. Mm -hmm. Well, all of a sudden, the value of that business is completely different because now it's, it has IP, right? And we have trademarks and we have patents and, and um, we can do things that nobody else can do. Anybody can put a, put alarm in a system, alarm right? system, but not, a, but nobody else can give you this feedback. And all of a sudden now, instead of it being a, uh, uh, an alarm company, now all of a sudden it's an IT company and we're on a SaaS basis and, and it's, uh, you know, so the multiples are different and, I mean, everything's different, right? So, it, it, but, but that, you take that, that, that was creativity, mm -hmm. right? Well, that's somebody, that Brock's been in the alarm business for so long, yeah. so it's something we well understand. Yep. So here's one thing. This is, you're going to get my other side, right? And this, he's like, oh, shoot. Just kidding. No, it's not <laughs> um, a bad way. Um, what I find I, I discouraging. Say, there's not a side of Jeremy I think I haven't seen. So <laughs> yeah, so no, you've good. seen every, <laughs> yeah, everything. Okay. So, well, what else I was going to say in defense to some of the guys that are building a widget, right? It's really hard for those guys to find funding right now, right? It's oh, that's just true. a tough deal. And so when I met with Governor Romney's office and we were talking about domesticating the latter, because currently ours is made overseas, they're made in China. And it's not something I want. It's just something that's a fact, right? And right now, the state of Utah, and the United States, is not super encouraging about bringing manufacturing yeah, home. So the fact, if you saying, look at this, every door is built in the U.S. and is intended to be Hinges and way. all. He would be doing the exact same thing with the ladders if he could, but... Yeah, we're getting we're getting completely blocked, and and not that they're saying that no, you can't build, but when you have when you can sit down with an office like Romney's office, and they say, well, look, it's really not something that's that what we're looking for. Like manufacturing ladders is not what we're trying to bring really to the state of Utah. We're really more into the SaaS world, and I mean, I'm like. We, excuse me, like I'm trying to bring jobs and like, well, we really want, you know, 110% plus of average, you know, income for the state. And we're looking more and that has a tendency to pay more. And I'm like, so you guys all realize that without the it, without the thing, all that stuff doesn't matter. Like, uh, I'll, and I'll just put savvy there, right? If you're not building something, if you're not selling something and I... Yeah, if you didn't have alarms, this wouldn't have occurred. Or if you didn't have right? the... Uh, th let's call it this solo cup for that matter, right? You, that's building the, you're building these, you don't need an alarm on the building at the yeah, bottom. The right. bottom line is Facebook and everything else comes down to a transactional item. Yep. No matter what it is, there's something in it. I mean, yeah, you may talk about, we have Clearview for data metrics and we have Sava, Savvy for alarm metrics and we have Qualtrics for survey and we have Twitter and we talk, I mean, oh, but the bottom line is at the end of the day, we're transacting something. Something we're buying something at some point at the very bottom level. There's something there that has to be bought and built, right? So if we eliminate and we forget about the widget, then all the other cloud stuffs kind of disappear. Look, dude. So how do we find some the of the right? wealthiest guys? I mean, you know, look at look at uh, look at Robert Workman. Yeah, right? he's a knit guy, and you know, he he uh, he started off with Provo Craft. I mean, he was selling um, he was selling uh, 
Um, little, the cricket. Uh, yeah. He did the cricket. Well, yeah, but before that, he started off. They were selling paper and stamps and. Oh yeah, yeah. And, the uh, book, the memory books, things. The yeah, I mean, I mean, there, it was a it was a craft store and paint and yeah and but but because he got out of there, he got creative and he created. Uh, he because uh, he was buying vinyl lettering. So anyway, the way his brain goes, all of a sudden now he's created the cricket, which is still incredibly. Uh, profitable. He's long sold it, but um, uh, it's incredibly profitable. Um, out of there, you know, he comes up with these new ideas. But um, to eliminate whole segments of business is to eliminate whole segments of opportunity. Had had Brock gone looking for money for an alarm company, he'd have gotten them. I mean, you yeah. know, he he had, but 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 because of that, other things come out of it. Your your doors don't look anything like what you what we began with. No, they're different, yeah. right? They're totally different. So I and guess so. No, so to, to your point, I don't look only. I mean, I do more stuff in tech because I'm trading software. Right, got it. Right, because that's where your developers work. Yeah, that's where our developers are. But um, we if don't, you're to put cash, you, you have invested in product. So, um, you know, uh, we we have a situation right now where, where um, uh, we have people with gun ranges. And uh, they want to uh, make game, live targets. Yeah, yeah, they want to gamify the range. It's an okay. awesome project. Yeah, so it's to, it, 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 but but it's somebody who's taking something that exists and through creativity is finding a different application. Those are the, and th- those are those are the those are the fun ones. Those are the exciting things. I mean, how many years have we had doors? Yeah, right. Just sure. centuries and centuries, millennia. We've had doors, and Jeremy now. Um, you, you can hang your, you, you can uh, put your shoes on your doors, right. you know, and you can, you have a dirty clothes hamper and, and you, I mean. Yeah, we just changed the way to use them. Right. right? And now it's, we're. It's never been, it's never been like that. Not, not literally not in thousands of years has that, has that happened. And now all of a sudden. On a door. Yeah. On, on, now on a door, I've got pool cues. I've got uh, wine racks. Guns, you name it. Right. right. I mean, uh, that's, that's the power of the creativity. I don't really care where you start. I care where your brain's going. Right, I care where you're going. What is it going to evolve into? Uh, that's that, that we keep coming back to that point of: Are you learning and growing? Yeah. That's that's what we're after. Because if you're, you know, look, I've never had a business plan I followed. I've made lots of business plans, but I never followed them because I am responding to the market. Mm-hmm. I don't want somebody who thinks to, to your point earlier. I've nailed it. This is what it is. Um, I just, I'm going to go skiing. We had a, an argue or not an argument. We had a, a segment last time about business plans and how sometimes they can be a little bit kind of funneling. Oh yeah. They can, so they I, can not that I don't think res- you should have a plan. No, like but they we're going to go from here to here, but Absolutely. they can become restricted. That's right. And I, I think yeah. sometimes we focus so much time on the plan and say, okay, what is this business plan? And I get this conversation a lot. So how should I write my business plan? I'm like, where are you at? Where do you want to go? What does it look like? Now let's define what the pathway looks like as we go. Because you don't, if you're going to write a business plan on what the pathway looks like before you start, yeah, it's, you you're going to be so it. wrong, right? Well, and you're not only going to do that, you're going to be taking you to the wrong way. You know, uh, gosh, um, it doesn't make any difference what what product you choose. Very few products ha- have resulted um, have have been what the original founder thought they would be, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean. Uh, it, it's just it's not very few come out that way so um you know uh, uh um, just because he's such a great inventor apple i mean he had a computer i promise it never crossed his mind that he would have a radio in his pocket yeah a little little phone that has more computing right. power than his mainframe desktop. did at the time that he he began yep. That's how, that was not in the original business plan, I promise you. Yeah. No, <laughs> that, right? guaranteed. That is not what it was. And well, so, I, they're important to have, but you have, but it's the creativity that comes from handling problems that opens up the opportunities, right? That's where, that's where you, you've got to be able to get up above and look down at your business separately. Sometimes we get so involved in the day-to-day activities that we, we, we can't, see anything in the future we've got to get up above and say where what 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 can what can happen here what can we do to really redefine this Uh, when we started our company we had no intention not only do we not expect our call center to look like it does but we had no intention to start a software company but 
if you if you you have to let your mind go, you have to be willing to take some risks, and uh, and that's why you say you look at people. That's wh- because that's, it doesn't. I don't care what you're if you're bringing right. me a a widget. I don't that's really care right. about the widget. I just want to see what you can do because your widget's probably not going to be the end game that I'm working. That's at. exactly right. So, to all you guys out there that are wondering what that looks like, it's that's why they say work on your pitch, because truly the widget isn't what people are investing. I'd say for the large majority, some of them are going to be looking at, you know, financial forecasts, and they're all fluff. Right at the end of the day, well, especially um, up front. Yeah, up front, it's all just made up. Right? Yeah, that's, that's, so make that as look as lucrative as you want. Find one online, print it, put your name on it, and that, that's about as right. real as it's going to get. Yeah. Right. But at the end of the day, when they say work on your pitch, just show your malleability, right, and how what you're able to, how malleable, I should say, yeah. that you can be, and that your ability to change with the de- customer demand or what you've learned through lessons and making sure that you realize that not nailed is okay in the sense of, whatever customer demands are that you can change to whatever that flow looks like. And I'm not saying that you always swerve at every one star. Like that is not what I'm trying to say here. And people, and I am guilty of it. Like, Oh my gosh, one star yeah, yeah, change yeah. everything. Um, and it's not, well, what, you were early. You were very responsive early. You're like, Oh my gosh, but you've learned. No, I'm going to go address them and learn uh, if, it, if it's valuable. Yeah. And, and honestly own it if it is yeah. and respond online that it's, you know what, they're 100% right. We had a customer, we couldn't get the door right. Yeah. I mean, there was everything wrong and it was an expensive door, bless her heart. Like one star, she says, if I could give a zero, she should have, and she should have. Like we could not get the order right. We didn't know what we were doing, right? And she said it very clearly and it was a fact and I owned it and it, I've never forgot it. You know, every business can do this and I, I it comes down to it's not you. It's making sure you have the right team members, the right people in your front court and your back court that is ready to help you in every aspect and to realize that you just need to talk. Like we have our meetings once a month. We go through our financials once a month. There's a lot of months, like 70 of them that were bad news maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there was a few. You know? So we had to, like, um, like you said yesterday, it's like, Jeremy, this little company, man, it, it has been on life support umpteen amount of times uh, early on yeah and then to think now you're like okay what's next and, and what we can take on is a complete different different animal right and you said we we expired debt really well we've done a good job of controlling that and making sure we were ready for downturns like we've been we've been a pretty good group but it comes down to the sense that when we go over our financials once a month with people that are not obligated to our financials that aren't making a whole bunch of money off our financials anyway but they give you advice on how to make sure you're not bleeding to death and we can listen and we can take those actions and put them to work every day to stop the bleeding and turn it into profit. I mean, Don has been religious. Like I want to know how we're going to get to this percentage of EBITDA by tomorrow. Like I need 17% or whatever the number is that he always, I know exactly what the number is, but you know, he, uh, one thing I know is math pretty good. Yes. (laughs) That's the one thing I'm like, okay, if I can do this and this, um, But it's been one of those check marks I do every day in the sense I start every morning. It's pretty religious of going through. I I go through social media every day. I type in our name every day. I type in our name on Google every day. I look and see what's being said. What's what's our our competitive landscape doing? What's our customer? Less important of competitive landscape is what are our customers saying? Right. I look on social and see what kind of feeds are there, what kind of posts people are sharing of our product. And now with Pinterest and Howes and, and that, there's millions of millions of posts and pins for Murphy Door. Right. Which is astounding to me that just a few years ago, I'm sitting in a fire station trying to come up with a way to figure out how to make a 10 door cell week. Right. right. So we look at it and, and I do police that daily. And the next thing I do is I look at analytics and say, how many visitors do we have? Let's see, look. I think that's really, I think that's an under, uh, th- th- this could be his whole segment. Sure. Is what are your high leverage activities? And then what is your ritual around them? Like we started this business thinking Home Depot was going to be how we would distribute. And we've sold a lot of doors through Home Depot, but you never let go of social media. And that's what's kept you independent. That's what's allowed you to be able to do, to, uh, uh, make independent choices of, uh, away from what any other big box uh, steer you to do. Yeah, vendor's going to make you do. And uh, 
um, you have a, a ritual built around knowing what is happening online. And so no, nothing sneaks up on you. And you, I mean, when, when Google changes the algorithm, you know day one. And we're able to get in and get something solved and within a few days. We are, uh, we correct. But boy, it. does that hurt. They have too much power. Well. Like for a small little company. And I, I mean, that's, that goes without saying, but for a small little company, when that algorithms change and we have to change metrics or we have something that's in violation to, to me as a fire guy sitting in a firehouse, it meant <laughs> nothing like, well, sir, how Oh, you're having this violation. Like, I don't even know what that means. Next thing you know, all our ads are pulled down. We're not selling it. They said, Hey John, bad news. Uh, oh yeah, no oh, cells. No. I Why? remember those. I didn't right. even know that they used to. I didn't. I didn't even know they did that. Yeah. But what what's powerful about it? And this is my point. This is where I'm trying to get to. Is that you've built the rituals around those things. So now you you've you've become an expert in social media, and you you are uh, you. I mean, you have people ar- around you. They're way are, smarter. Yeah. But you're an expert in social media, and you read it every day, and you know what uh, uh, what the pulse is for the company, and you see it early if there's going to be a problem, and we begin immediately trying to correct it now. Rather That's this than, poor bugger. When I start hitting a panic alarm, I'm like, yeah. "Oh no, oh no! Here, you got to fix this. We're making a we're making a clip right now. Like we've got yeah. to address this, and it's just one dude, right? And I'm like, "We've got to make this is Felicity. We're going to make sure it's right. Oh. Let's build something. If, you, if your ritual's wrong." Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if if your ritual's <laughs> wrong, then you can't know that until it's too late. And then it's too late, and then you sink. Yeah, because how are you going to fix it a month later? You can't fix that a month later. You can't. Right? You have to start all over. For you, because that's your ritual, and that's why you've got to be really smart about what your daily rituals are, because those daily rituals are the things that allow you to identify early what your opportunities are and what your losses are going to be. And if we can leverage those quickly then we have the ability to be able to really drive a business. And that's, uh, uh, that, that could be its whole segment. It but. can be that just, so if you took those exact words and applied it to people, yeah, those exact words applied to a someone. It's true. This I mean, employees, family members, yeah. it, it's, it's ironic how when you start building a business and it has its own, we'll call it a social security number, yeah. you're really building an individual to be able to stand on its own. So the, a lot of the principles that we use to build people, are going to be the same for business. And when they say, Hey, you know, we're just, I'm sorry. It's just business. I had a, I had a really interesting conversation in Nashville this weekend. And, and he just said, that is such bull crap coming from you, such bull crap. And I'm like, look, sometimes you just have to be disengaged because I don't believe you not for one second. And I'm like, okay. And I, and I was like taken back because he got the nicest guy on the planet. Like this guy is like the soft, like flower child. And I'm like, woo, who is this guy? He's like, you think I believe one thing you're saying right now? He goes, you've just discredited what I believe in you because that is not true what you just said. It is not about business. This is all about people, business is second. I'm like, he ate my lunch and I didn't know what to say because I'm not left with that words a lot of the time. (laughs) (laughs) But you know why you were speechless is because he's right. Yeah, he was right. Uh, Only people make money. And like, oh, dude, you got capital and you got IP and you got... Right, you got all the, all these resources. Only people make money. That's why uh, I'm always. It's always about, about people, the person. I, I I never had any dream of being in a door business. I had a dream of of working with Jeremy. You happen to put us in the door business. I didn't think I was in the door business either way. By yeah. the way, I never right. thought I'd do that. So I mean, we could go on forever. You've yeah. just, uh, I love the enlightenment that you give a lot of the feedback that you give. And I think it's so powerful because it's helped really build me as a business guy. And more importantly, as a family, like as bad as I am at it, I'm not a great family guy. <laughs> and I recognize I try, but I'm short. Like there's, there's facts that I just, I work as a, as a Look, level. It's the for same me. thing about growth. Cause I'm calling him on this. The fact is, is that, um, uh, nobody's great, uh, inherently great at relationships. We have to work on those. I have to work on a relationship with my wife. I have to work on my relationship with my kids. And then the kids move into a different phase of life and it changes the dynamic and I have to find a different way to be able to connect. And so, uh, what you just barely said is, oh, you're human and, uh, you're really engaged with your kids and your kids love you. And, uh, you're, uh, working with them as they move through their transitions in life. And that takes time and effort and, uh, that there's no shortcut around it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people, no, you said about, 13 hours a day with your, or 13 hours a week with your spouse. I read, I, I, well, yeah, I, <laughs> That's what you said. yeah, I read that. Uh, <laughs> I read that once that, uh, strong marriages need 13 hours a week of one-on-one time. And I remember thinking, Holy crap. I'm like, like not half of that. Um, but 
I took that to heart and fundamentally we changed how we were living and um, I changed my business schedule so that my wife got and now she now she gets plenty but at that time it was hard to find 13 hours but we found it and it made a huge difference in our life i mean it requires effort and it requires consistency and to your point whether it's a business or your spouse or your child it requires effort and consistency to be able to bring about a meaningful relationship and we kid ourselves and say oh i give him uh, I, I don't give quantity of time i give quality of time um that's that, that is not such a thing yeah, and, and it's for everything. Yeah, that for everything. That's for everything. exactly correct. You know, I want to be that big. How'd you get like that? Well, it's time. Yep. It's not quality of time. It's not luck. It's this. You want to, it's, we say this over and over. And Elon Musk said it on a video. And I swear I said it, uh, not that I'm saying I took it before, but I've been saying to myself, look, if I want to build a company faster, I just have to work longer. Yeah. And since I was a kid, it's not, and he was able to put it to words, but I just knew that it just took time. And so to work 20 hour days or 30 hour days or, and I, and I mean that, and you yeah, know, I yeah, do yeah, 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 I have 40 yeah. hour, oh, yeah. like oh, it no. doesn't matter. I'll do it. Yeah, no. I mean, especially with fire, those are 40. So a 48 hour shift is just to work at a fire station. So to think to come here and be do that, it's impossible. It's not, but if you want to compound your growth at home or at work, it's only related to time. That is right. It's all. Yeah. And, and I thank you for yours. Like yeah. it's been a lot of fun nope. today. And Love I know being you have with a you two anytime and this is great. And uh, you're doing a lot of great things. I think this, uh, I hope this podcast really helps a lot of people. Well, I hope so too. And yeah. I, I, it's helping me. So this is also selfish. Yeah. So again, just like <laughs> well, trying good. to make smiles. So. <laughs> Thank good. you again, John. Again, this is John Porter from Focus. And uh, we want you to, if you like the podcast, let us know at the bottom. Uh, subscribe to our channel if you want. If not, that's totally okay. But we'd love to hear your comments. Good or bad, I like them both. There They're fuel both ways. It'll help me fix me, if anything. So, and John needs some, you know, some humble stuff. If you don't mind throwing some stuff in there, <laughs> that would help bring him down a little bit. That'd be be wonderful. Perfect. Just kidding. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Okay, yep. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to 90 Proof Wisdom Podcast. Hopefully, there was a takeaway for you. If you like what we're doing or even our efforts, tell your friends about it. Let us know what we could do better. Again, thank you for listening to 90 Proof Wisdom Podcast. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button.